Hello, I'm Glenn Hennessy, Director of Marketing and Communications for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. I'm pleased to introduce our exhibition, Affairs of State, 118 Years of Diplomacy and Entertaining at Anderson House. Diplomacy and entertaining have always gone hand in hand in the nation's capital. Anderson House, the headquarters of the Society of the Cincinnati and its American Revolution Institute, has played a historic role in that story during the 20th and 21st centuries, but one that has largely gone untold. Since its opening in 1905, the mansion has been the site of hundreds of diplomatic, patriotic, philanthropic, and cultural events. Anderson House has established itself as a uniquely sought after destination in Washington, D.C. for heads of state, government officials, diplomats, and society leaders wanting a place to form relationships, consider challenges, and share common values. Affairs of State chronicles nearly 120 years of the people and events that have given Anderson House its place in the diplomatic and cultural history of the American Republic and its capital city. When Lars and Isabel Anderson set about designing a house on the vaunted Massachusetts Avenue, it was planned specifically for entertaining heads of state, government leaders, other diplomats, friends and family in a setting that conveyed the couple's interests and values. For more than 30 years, Anderson House served as the temporary residence of foreign heads of state, meeting place of the American Red Cross and base of operations for foreign missions during World War I, as well as the site of private diplomatic and social functions the Andersons hosted. From the first dinner for six that christened the dining room on March 29, 1905, to 800 guests at inaugural receptions thrown for their friend President William H. Taft, to the dozens of philanthropic events held to support various patriotic or international causes, the Andersons used their home to serve their country and its causes. Lars Anderson's last act of patriotic service was to ask his wife to donate their Washington home to the Society of the Cincinnati after his death, which came in 1937. The Society of the Cincinnati is America's first patriotic organization, founded in 1783 at the end of the American Revolution, to keep alive the memory of that vast event which secured our independence. The great-grandson of a Revolutionary War officer, Lars had been a devoted member of the Society and had its symbols and history incorporated into the decoration of Anderson House. The Anderson's gift, formalized in 1938, provided the organization with its one and only headquarters building. Following the Andersons' civic model, the society contributed at a time of national crisis when the United States was plunged into the Second World War by lending the building to the U.S. Navy for urgently needed office space. After that conflict ended, the society allowed official government entertaining in the house for decades as the need for appropriate space for entertaining heads of state and their representatives was vast. Before the State Department diplomatic reception rooms were established in the 1960s, and even for many years thereafter, Anderson House was a preferred setting for diplomatic entertaining in Washington. Winston Churchill, Thurgood Marshall, Marjorie Merriweather Post, Jacqueline Kennedy, and nine American presidents are among the guests who were feted within its doors. These traditions continue today, with Anderson House sought out by government officials, diplomats, journalists, schools, business leaders, civic and cultural organizations, and families with an important occasion to mark. Freemasonry has burned as a blazing fire through the last three centuries, burnishing some of mankind's greatest achievements. It has illuminated and inspired some of the most treasured works of literature, music, and art. It has pushed philosophers to dream beyond horizons. It has guided visionaries to found new nations. And it has brought peace and harmony into the hearts of millions. Its grand principles are there for all to see. Brotherly love, the welcome to all people under heaven. Relief, a dedication to charitable work. And truth, the daily search for moral advancement.
thank you from the bottom of my heart for the kindness which you have shown me. I value this honor and let it be a help to all those forces. They are, in my opinion, irresistible forces which draw our two nations together, not for any unworthy purpose of combination or gathering strength, but in order that we may defend for the freedom of the world. Regarding the First World War, Winston Churchill said after the end of the World War of 1914, was Winston Churchill a member of a secret fraternity, yes or no? Yes, he was. Isn't that fascinating? Was Stalin a member of a secret fraternity, yes or no? Yes, he was. Well, maybe history is not as boring as you thought, young guys. Isn't that so? I always thought history was boring when I was a kid. But today I find it fascinating, putting the pieces together. Wow. Now it is interesting that in secret societies there are always two doctrines. One for the initiated and one for the goyim, the uninitiated. And the Knights Templars had two doctrines. The one was the inside esoteric occult doctrine, and the other one was the exoteric, the one to the outside, and that was Catholicism. So the masses received a religion which the insiders turned on its head. Amongst occult insiders, Lucifer is the true Son of God. Jesus is a second son who was defeated by the first one who had been thrown out. So Lucifer is the true luminary, the victor in the battle, and will be the one who will be worshipped at the end of time. That is occult doctrine. That's always been the doctrine of the Kabbalah, the Kabbalist doctrine, and it has been the doctrine of Gnosticism. But of course... It's not what the Bible teaches, but then Catholicism doesn't teach what the Bible teaches either. Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14, talks about ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. And they will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Now we're going to deal with the whole chapter of Revelation 17 at a later stage. But the kings of the world, here represented by these ten, will give their power to the system, just like in the Middle Ages, and enforce the doctrines on an entire world. Very interesting. This will be this beast from the bottomless pit. Now, Gary H. Carr, in his work on route to global occupation, puts it this way. He says there were the ancient mystery religions, which come from Babylon, and uh, they were pantheistic, of course, which means God is in nature, God is in everything, which in, in effect makes us God then too. This was inculcated in Kabbalism, was taken over, in the Christian era, in what is called Gnosticism, and the Knights Templars were the inner secret core that had the ancient knowledge of the mystics. This was carried further through Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry and the Illuminati, which according to Gary Carr controls Marxism, American European secret societies and political societies, international banking, and the World Council of Churches. Now that sounds very strange. Is the World Council of Churches controlled by Freemasonry? We'll have to look into that in some detail. Then of course you have the entire New Age movement, the Theosophical Societies, the many cults, and all these things are all controlled by this mechanism to make null and void the doctrine of salvation in Christ alone. That will be the final battle. And in order to achieve this, this woman has concealed herself and has hid herself in a garb of Christianity 
and people receive the Goyim doctrine and do not know what the inner core doctrine is. Christianity and the secret societies, we could just summarize it as follows. The old Babylonian religion gave rise to Kabbalism via the Essenes and others, Gnosticism came into existence and Gnosticism was founded by Simon Magus. This comes from no other source than History of Lamagi and uh, by Eliphas Levi. Wow, that's a high Masonic source. So Gnosticism founded by Simon Magus. Then this Gnosticism with its secret doctrine was eventually over time through many intermediary organizations carried over to the Knights Templars. And the Knights Templars were a group of a, a Roman Catholic order, if you like, that were set over the temple site to protect it. And they had strong links to Islamic societies, the Ismailis, the Karmatites, the Fatimites, the Druzes, and the Assassins. And these are very, very interesting, and we'll be dealing with them when we talk about the Islamic connection, what the secret societies actually teach. Just like the Templars had two doctrines, one for the Goyim, the uninitiated, and one for the insiders, and the two diametrically opposed to each other, so the secret societies of Islam do exactly the same thing. But that's another lecture. Now the Templars, they had their secret inner information inculcated in the Rosicrucians and the Jesuits. The Jesuits again formed and created Freemasonry. And Freemasonry was created as the Protestant arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Unbeknown to them, beguiled, fooled, if you like, into doing the work that Rome wanted them to do so that Rome could sit in the background while Freemasonry did it for them. And then it wasn't them, it was them. And it was mainly Protestants that were doing it, and not Rome. Very clever. Very, very clever indeed. The Society of the Cincinnati. I learned about this little organization a few months ago, and in putting together this presentation on it, I decided to play a few of those clips from Walter Veith. I've been watching a bunch of Walter Veith lately, and particularly this part where he shows this graphic from Gary H. Kaw's book showing this progression from the Babylonian mystery religions and down through Kabbalah, the Gnostics, and then the Templars, Rosicrucians, and Freemasons and everything, and showing you that it's really all part of one continuous push through history, the mystery school, you know, tree, if you will. And what I find most fascinating is how Veith argues that Freemasonry was created by the Vatican and the Jesuits, um, which, of course, a lot of people would take issue with, as historically, even up to just a couple months ago, Roman Catholicism prohibits people from joining Masonic fraternities for several hundred years. But, of course, that's kind of the whole idea, is that it's like plausible deniability, but it really does kind of present an interesting picture of what's really going on here. If, indeed, Freemasonry is just part of this whole... Babylonian mystery religion, you know, this whole progression of, of the mystery religions throughout Europe and throughout the world, headquartered in, in Rome. But um, I also like how Veith explains that it's more of a philosoph, you know, it's not just the organizations themselves, but it's really just the promulgation of these beliefs in society as a whole, and that it's more of a philosophical empire. So I wanted to play that up front just to kind of show that that is the framework at which I am now approaching all this material now and kind of looking back through history and specifically through the American Revolution kind of from this perspective and really all starting kind of with how my, my approach to Bible prophecy and eschatology since digging into this book, guys like Philip Morrow, 
who wrote uh, 100 years ago, arguing that the second beast of Revelation 13 is the Roman Catholic Church, is the Roman Empire, um, which essentially just changed form, and this is the, the head that was wounded, you know, the, the, the head that had the fatal wound but yet lived, that this is the Roman Empire. And this is just kind of fascinating to me because it just changes your whole perspective on looking back from the time of Christ all the way through till today and what is going on now. And I don't know, maybe it's kind of part of this whole, I guess it's kind of a meme now, like the, like how, how often do people think about the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, particularly here in America or the, or the West as a whole, it, it's something you hear all over the place. It's crazy how empires rise and fall. And that's one of the things that people are wondering currently about America, if we're in the last throes of a dying empire. Well, here's my, I got a hot take on this. Please. I don't think they do. So I don't think the Roman Empire fell. I think it became a church. I think the, so the, the Rome fell, but the Roman Empire became the church. Where's mm. all the money from the Roman Empire? The Vatican. In the basement of the Vatican is yeah. where it is, yeah. For reasons that I'm sure I don't have to explain to many of you, uh, with everything everything that's going on in our current um, yeah peak clown world political climate and you know with these ridiculous uh, elections coming up and you know there's just so much that is it's so absurd at this point and perhaps intentionally so to where people are have lost faith in the government and in these institutions on a scale that we you know we've just certainly never seen in our lifetimes America's dead so yeah, there's a lot of people, a lot of people now wondering, like, are they seriously collapsing uh, the uh, the American empire, the American experiment, if you will, the American supremacy, the, this monopolar hegemony of the, you know, the U.S. petrodollar and essentially the political dynamics that we have seen throughout most of our lives, if not all of our lives from the end of World War II and through the Cold War and now you know, we had the War on Terror and yeah everything is just now kind of getting to a point where you're wondering like how much longer you know particularly with the economy and printing of trillions of dollars since 2020 and so yeah the empire the question of the empire <laughs> what does this mean and what is happening and how does this play into Bible prophecy and uh you know, it's pretty obvious to anyone who's halfway paying attention at this point that there is a clear strategy in place to you know, flood Europe and North America with people migrating from all over the world and um, being facilitated by all these NGOs and the UN and, and all this stuff. So, that was a really roundabout way of saying yes. <laughs> The American empire appears to be circling the drain or just at the very least going into a dramatic decline. And so the question is, is like, yeah, how much of this really is part of the plan and how much of it was really part of the plan all along? And it's pretty interesting, like this whole society of the Cincinnati, I'd never even heard of this group. But it was founded on May 13th, 1783, and this is four years before the framing of the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution in 87, and six years before George Washington even um, was sworn in as the first U.S. president in 1789. And so he was elected the first president general of the society from 1783 till he died in 1799. 23 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were members and it has 14 sub-societies, one for each of the original 13 colonies, and there's a 14th one for France. Uh, it was founded to perpetuate, quote, the remembrance of this vast event, which was the achievement of American independence, and to preserve inviolate those exalted rights and liberties of human nature and to, quote, render permanent the cordial affection subsisting among the officers of the Continental Army who served in the Revolutionary War. And this is what's really fascinating is that, okay, for all these, you know, largely English, Protestant, supposedly Christian men who were so serious about democracy and all the things that we associate with the American Revolution and the Constitution, that before they even had a constitution, before they even really knew if they had a country or not, they decided, you know what we need to do is set up this hereditary society 
where only the officers who served in the Revolutionary War were able to become members. And being a hereditary society means that the membership was passed down to, just like it sounds, to your, you know, to your, to an heir. <laughs> All in the name of preserving the history of this great event. And indeed, it was all... Once you start really looking into it, the vast majority, if not all these guys, are Freemasons. You know, including Lafayette over in France. And they have these eagle uh, pendants. The first one, which was the, the diamond eagle worn by Washington as the first president and then each successive president. It was the special one with all these jewels. And so it was essentially like a knighthood. It was an order of uh, hereditary, you know, members. So just the fact that this even exists in America at all, let alone before virtually anything else was even figured out, they, they decided they needed to have this Society of the Cincinnati put into place. And it did get actually quite a bit of pushback in both America and France particularly because it was a hereditary society. And so I think they eventually did away with the hereditary membership aspect in France, and they temporarily did in the U.S., but eventually reinstituted that. And then they have this kind of sub-organization called the... What do they call it? They have this American Revolution Institute, which, you know, they even have a, a YouTube channel and all these lectures online. They're still putting out material to this day. I've, I've watched a number of them. So it's just kind of amazing that <laughs> just why you would need, why they would think this was so important. And indeed, this is a, I would say, when you start looking at who these members were and just the fact that like the, the jeweler that they eventually chose to make the official manufacturer of these eagle pendants was in france it's the same place where freemason bartholdi worked and you know who's the guy who designed the statue of liberty which was originally supposed to be at the head of the suez canal so yeah this whole question of how much of the american revolution was indeed all part of a masonic slash jesuit slash everything else you know, from the very beginning, how much of this was a contrived revolution? Um, which perhaps is something that I'm only able to even really kind of consider with, you know, not, when you look at just how contrived things like, yes, the, the whole conflict with Ukraine and you know, Russia or the Middle East and Gaza and Iran or, you know, you name it, like pretty much every conflict in our lifetime and before that has been extremely manipulated, which is pretty obvious at this point. But yeah, even just looking into like the whole battles of Lexington and Concord and, and the shot that was heard around the world and nobody knew who fired it and what, you know, when you really kind of step back and, and just read it and go like, why, why was this event the, the thing that finally kicked it all off? And why w you, you start to really kind of recognize the propagandistic markers all over the place paul revere's midnight ride and oh but by the way he was a freemason so many of these guys were but this is fascinating when you understand that at this time around the world the jesuits were getting kind of kicked out of all kinds of countries around the world where they had been you know emissaries and diplomats and, and founding universities and things like that there was a lot of backlash against the jesuit order which never really happened in america but you have the whole colony of Maryland with Lord Baltimore and, you know, it was kind of this Catholic safe haven amongst all these other quote-unquote Protestant ones, even though, like, yeah, okay, when you look at Jamestown, Virginia, which was the first um, colony by the Virginia Company, you know, first colony from England in, uh, was it 1607? And today, what do you find there? You find this giant obelisk with the eagles and um, all this Masonic symbolism there, you know, which is a weird way to memorialize a bunch of Protestant uh, pilgrims, you know, just trying to seek freedom and, and a new life. And obviously there were a lot of people fleeing Europe from various types of religious persecution, both from the Catholic Church and other different reasons, all, all after kind of the, uh, the, the Reformation. But the Society of the Cincinnati is named after this farmer who became the emperor of Rome for a short while. 
he was the general who led the troops into into battle into victory and then handed the the empire back to the people well back to the senate so this whole iconography of cincinnatus and portraying george washington as this modern representation of the same sort of figure in the same act of giving the empire back to the people or just giving it back <laughs> I, th I found that really fascinating in terms of like how you can see how there's kind of the outward way the outward interpretation that we're all supposed to believe and take away and then a potentially more esoteric understanding of giving you know like who is it being given back to is is the real question right and how much of this all was just theater in the same way that uh, so much of what we see going on today is is theater even though real people clearly die and are kind of thrown into the meat grinder of war in this you know human sacrifice kind of manner but um yeah the the men in suits the men the officers <laughs> the businessmen and you know when you get into the whole british east india company and how huge of a role that played in everything that was going on in the world and the seven years war and these guys were all freemasons this is how freemasonry essentially was spread around the world in a very short period of time was through the british east india company whose flag, coincidentally enough, looks very similar to what they eventually chose for the American flag. And so, I just find this all fascinating when you kind of think about, just like as Walter V says, that, you know, traces back through the Rosicrucians, and then before that you had the Templars, and as everyone knows, the Knights Templar were essentially where international banking first germinated and, and took hold and spread to the rest of the world. You know, before you had the Rothschild dynasty, it was the Templars. And everyone kind of caught on to the Templars, and they had to kind of be disbanded, and essentially they just got absorbed into the Knights the Knights of Malta. The Templars were never really disbanded. They just kind of changed the name. They rebranded. And then eventually they started the, the Jesuit order in the wake of the Protestant Reformation as part of the, the Counter-Reformation. And then everyone eventually caught on to the Jesuits, and uh, they had to kind of rebrand and go underground a little bit. And then, so it really makes sense to me that you have this kind of succession of these groups of of occult initiates, is you know essentially what it is, whose mission is basically to propagate the mystery school teachings to the world and in the guise of Christianity. And this is why it is this, it's, I feel like this is kind of essential to understanding that yes, the spirit of Antichrist that has been at work since the early church, since Jesus was here, the spirit of Antichrist has been at work and spreading a false Christ and a false gospel and a false understanding of the world and science and everything. It's, it's the mixing of the occult doctrines going all the way back to Babylon and Greece and, and all this stuff with concepts that are you know, rooted in, in the Bible and Christianity, but then distorted and warped. And speaking of Greece and Plato, one of the things that I've been reading, I've read through it a couple times now, you can listen to the audiobook on YouTube here, is Manly P. Hall's Secret Destiny of America. And if you haven't listened to this, I, I would highly recommend it because it's pretty fascinating in terms of like saying all the, uh, you know, saying all the, the quiet parts out loud in a way. Essentially where he's, he's basically saying that there is this order of the unknown philosophers that have been at work in the world for thousands of years, going all the way back to Plato, and his idea of the Republic and creating this ideal civilization in the world through all these kind of cycles of trial and error and empires rising and falling. But this, these unknown philosophers, these sort of secret agents have been at work throughout the world and, and in the courts of kings and you know, essentially describing people like the, the Jesuits and the Freemasons and all these guys like John Dee and uh, Francis Bacon and, and all these different monks and mystics and Kabbalists and astrologers and, and uh, all sorts of things that have been busy little bees throughout history spreading the so-called truth of the enlightenment of humanity you know so he's he's admitting to the whole idea of a worldwide centuries-long conspiracy to build a one a perfect one world order it's just he's saying it's good and um it's all kind of there for it's it's just astonishing but um yeah so he he goes into like the new atlantis and this whole idea and it's basically arguing that yeah america is the new atlantis 
the Solomon's house, this, this secret college that was designed to kind of dole out wisdom and technology to the world in, in order for its betterment and for, you know, the enlightenment of, of mankind. And, you know, when you really look back at, like, how bizarre it really is that so much of the technological innovation and the, the science and the... And not just that, but, like, in terms of propaganda and Hollywood and stoking the fires of the imagination of the rest of the world, just the role that the United States has played, just from a propaganda standpoint, Like the builders of old, each Freemason takes up the square and compasses. As he applies these tools to his morals and becomes more skilled in the craft, he progresses from entered apprentice to fellow craft and finally master Mason. In rich ceremonies of timeless drama, he is presented with centuries of wisdom on life's greatest questions, on birth, life, and death. He is guided to reflect on the brotherhood of man dwelling together under the eye of God, and the ways in which each can so conduct himself as to live respected and to die regretted. Through these unique experiences, each brother carves a stone of the great temple in his own way. I hold that to be self-evident, Brother Franklin. All men are created equal. Indeed, Brother Washington. All Freemasons meet as equals, and we have an opportunity to create a nation in the very essence of Masonic morality. With freedom and tolerance of all religions and moralities that no government can oppress. You know, I think it would be a great idea if we wore our Masonic regalia when we're uh, putting in the place the foundation stone for the Capitol building. Freedom of speech too, and the press, the right to peaceful assembly and... Did you say regalia? Yes. Well, it would be wonderfully symbolic, don't you think? You'll be wanting to put the all-seeing eye on our banknotes next. Mm. Uh, you, uh, you think I'm taking it a bit far? Please don't ask me questions like that, Brother Franklin. You know I cannot tell a lie. Oh, oh come on, Brother Washington. Everybody lies occasionally, surely. Especially politicians. Not me. Not even so much as an alternative fact. Oh, well, we must all be aware of fake news. <laughs> the people must be free to think what they like as well. We can have no thought police in our new society. I couldn't agree with you more. Without freedom of thought, there can be well, no such thing as wisdom. You know, I do agree with you, though. The foundation stone of our new nation built on all those principles that we hold dear perfect in its parts and honorable to the builder. And the, the, uh, the plans for our new capital city already have a very Masonic feel to them. Yeah. You know, I still don't think Potomac City has enough of a ring to it, though, somehow. Have you given any thought to a name, Brother Washington? I'm still working on that one. Good evening, Brother George. Well, hello, Brother Hiram. Brother Benjamin. And who's your friend? Oh, this is Mr. Avney, our candidate for initiation into the order. I'm giving him a little introduction into some of our mysteries. Good evening, gentlemen. Oh, hey, um, what a privilege to be shown round by Hiram himself. Yes, I'm learning a great deal. And these two gentlemen are founding an entire nation built on our principles. There we have great promises for our new nation. You know, I wonder if other presidents after me will also be Freemasons. Well, of course. I mean, I'll... Oh, well, I just sort of assumed. I'm afraid not, Ben. But many will be.
and Freemasonry will become embedded in the American culture. And the I will appear on the banknotes. Oh, God. As will your face. Oh, God. And in years to come, these principles will be honored with a gift from your French brethren. A gift that will be a welcoming beacon to the poor and oppressed when they journey to your great land. Brother Bartholdi! I've always liked the French. Uh, what's that? This is the statue we are giving you. It's a bit small, isn't it? Oh, this is a maquette. The real thing is bigger. Much, much bigger. I call her Liberty Enlightening the World. Catchy! I like her. I love her. Liberty's what we're all about. And life. And life. Life and liberty's what we're all about. And the pursuit of happiness. Well, of course the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness goes without saying. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Forgive me for being naive, but if the people spend all their time pursuing happiness, how on earth can they expect to build a successful nation? Hmm, well... How about life, liberty, labor, and the pursuit of happiness? Labor is just as important as refreshment. It's the rule of three, Brother Benjamin. Believe me, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness will play much better. Faith, hope, and charity. Beauty, truth, strength. I'm afraid he's right, but as a nation, you will labor hard. You will labor very hard indeed, and you will play hard. America will produce a great many great Americans from many different walks of life and many different fields, and many will be Masons. Sportsmen, actors, writers, soldiers, filmmakers, businessmen, inventors, Astronauts! Uh, what on earth is an astronaut? <laughs> no, they're not. I don't follow. Well, they're not on Earth, they're in space. In fact, Brother Buzz Aldrin was the second man to walk upon the surface of the moon. Uh, that's the best thing I've heard this evening. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. <laughs> So on that note of propaganda and scientism, interestingly enough, right across the street from the Anderson House, where the Society of the Cincinnati headquarters resides, is the Cosmos Club. And I'd also never heard of the Cosmos Club, but it is most interesting to look into the history of this particular establishment. It's a gentleman's club founded in 1878 for those interested in science. And its members included three U.S. presidents, two vice presidents, U.S. Supreme Court justices, artists, writers, businessmen, government officials, uh, university presidents, 36 Nobel Prize winners, 61 Pulitzer Prize winners, 55 Presidential Medal of Freedom recipients. And what I found really interesting was the fact that it was formed out of the Philosophical Society of Washington, which itself is a very interesting organization, founded in 1871, which meets regularly at the Cosmos Club. So they're essentially one and the same thing. But uh, that was founded by John Wesley Powell, who was the guy who first explored the Colorado River and navigated the, the Grand Canyon and things like this. And apparently Lake Powell, behind Hoover Dam, is named after him. And the Philosophical Society of Washington, I would say, is basically modeled after the American Philosophical Society, which was founded in the 1700s by Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia. 
But the Cosmos Club gave birth to a bunch of other societies uh, as well, including the National Geographic Society in 1888, the Wilderness Society in 1935, and the Washington Academy of Sciences. The American Institute of Physics was also formed there in 1931, along with the Explorers Club, the Geological Society of Washington, the Council of Foreign Relations, and the Washington Academy of Sciences also regularly met at the Cosmos Club. So, yeah, the CFR, among everything else. And then there's a whole ton of, like, other clubs that have, like, reciprocal memberships in different cities all along the East Coast and uh, all around the world including the Athenaeum in London, the Carlton Club in London, the Caledonian Club in London, the Club Financiero Genova in Madrid, the East India Club in London. I haven't even had a chance to look into a lot of these. I mean, the amount of information that... <laughs> the amount of rabbit trails that you can go off just on Wikipedia with these crazy DC societies is pretty amazing. Kind of once you realize what you're really looking at and the role that all these institutions have played in shaping the culture and academia and what people regard as, as science worldwide and realizing that this <laughs> this is the real empire if you will that has taken over the world and penetrated the hearts and minds of, of men far beyond the more sort of base appeals to patriotic service and war on terror and all this stuff. And in the perpetuation of belief in the globe, I, I don't know that the if there's any, like the National Geographic Society in terms of their involvement in the expeditions to the North and South Pole and handing out all these awards to different explorers and crafting the narrative. You know, really, these are the... Uh, the purveyors and the the gatekeepers of the entire history of how we supposedly mapped the world and explored the new world continent of the Americas and beyond. And so, yeah, it, it's a long game con that I, under, I, I understand why it, it's a big pill for a lot of people to swallow when you present them with the notion that we're not living on a spinning ball flying through space at thousands of miles an hour spiraling around a black hole that's trying to plunge everything into it and, and everything else. But, I mean, the, fa <laughs> the all-seeing eye right above the globe with the, uh, the eagle's wings or the phoenix, however you want to really interpret this, I mean... You really can't make this stuff up. And, um, yeah, this whole idea of philosophy. Clearly, the, the founding fathers of this nation, they were so steeped. Even if you want to poo-poo all the Masonic Institute, like, it, everything in D.C., <laughs> it's all Masonic from, from where I stand. But you can't deny, even if you want to just poo-poo that as all conspiracy theory paranoia, which I don't know how you can even do that at this point, but just the undeniable fact that, like, everything about the Founding Fathers, they were so saturated and enamored with philosophy and all these principles of the Enlightenment. I mean, it's like right there in the name. In <laughs> that it doesn't really get any more antichrist than the concept of enlightenment. That's a Luciferian term, just on its face. But um, I mentioned Philip Marl before, and uh, somebody shared with me recently this really good short essay that he wrote uh, for a, a compilation called The Fundamentals in 1910. This is a volume two, so there's... You know, different contributions by by different authors, and and he's talking about modern philosophy, and once again, man, this guy was I don't know I don't know if he was ahead of his time or just yeah he was just a phenomenal writer and thinker and the way he was talking about how human philosophy is incompatible with the biblical worldview and has become the dominant guiding force in universities and seminaries and the church and everything and so. I won't read the whole thing, but I highly, um, you can read it. I think Biola has a digital version of it online. And then there's also a, uh, there's also an audio version that you can listen to, whatever's easiest. But this is a fantastic piece that he wrote over a hundred years ago. And I'm just going to read his closing remarks. This is the situation it brought about. 
now that Christianity has been politely bowed out of our schools and seminaries in order to make room for the irrational philosophy of Hinduism, uh, he argues that essentially it's, it's a pantheistic worldview that has become predominant. Very pertinent in this connection are the words of the prophet, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Jeremiah 8, 9. For the occupation in which our philosophers are engaged is the impossible task of trying to establish an explanation of the visible universe after having rejected the true account thereof received from its creator. I love that. The God of the ruling philosophy is the one who is not permitted to speak or make himself known in any way. Philosophy must needs put these restraints upon him for its own protection. For, should he break through them, the occupation of the philosopher would be gone. So he must remain in impenetrable obscurity, speaking no word, and making no intelligible sign or motion, in order that philosophers may continue their congenial business of making bad guesses at what he is like. <laughs> it is not difficult for one who has come to the knowledge of the truth through receiving the word of God, quote, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, to perceive the folly and futility of all this. But who shall deliver the ignorant, the innocent, and the unwary from being victimized and eternally despoiled by these men who, professing themselves to be wise, have become fools? We can but sound the alarm and give warning, especially to those who are responsible for bringing up children, of the dangers which infect the intellectualistic atmosphere of our universities, colleges, and seminaries. In closing, we may with profit to our readers point out a profound reason why the enemy of Christ and of the men whom he seeks to save should be desirous of impressing upon the minds of the latter the conception of pantheism. That doctrine wholly excludes the idea that man is a sinner, and hence it puts redemption outside the pale of discussion. Under the influence of that doctrine, man would never discover his corrupt nature and his need of salvation, and hence, if not delivered from it, he would die in his sins. An enemy of man could devise against him no greater mischief than this. But the doctrine which the philosophy of our day has imported from India works not only destruction to men, but also dishonor to God. Herein may its satanic character be clearly perceived by all who have eyes to see. Its foundation principle is that God and man are truly one in substance and being, and that the character of God is revealed in the history of humanity. Yeah. This, is, this summarizes all the mystery school teachings from masonry all the way back. This evil doctrine makes God the partner with man in all the manifold and grievous wickedness of humankind. It makes him particeps criminis in all the monstrous crimes, cruelties, uncleanness, and unnameable abominations that have stained the record of humanity. It makes him really the prime actor in all sins and wickedness since the thought and impulses prompting them originate with him. Thus God is charged with all the evil deeds which the Bible denounces, and against which the wrath of God of the Bible is declared. It may be that somewhere in the dark places of the sinful world there lurks a doctrine more monstrously wicked, more characteristically satanic than this, which is now installed in our seats of learning and there openly venerated as the last word of matured human wisdom. But, if such there be, the writer of these pages is not aware of its existence. Okay, listen to this. That doctrine is virtually the assurance, given under the seal of those who occupy the eminences of human culture, learning, and wisdom, that the pledge of the serpent given to the parents of the race of what would result if they would follow his track has at last been redeemed. Ye shall become as God, he declared. And now the leaders of the thought of the day unite in proclaiming that man and God are truly one substance and nature. Beware, beware. This teaching is, indeed, according to human tradition, the most ancient of all human traditions. It is according to the basic principles of the world and of the God of this world, and not according to Christ. No greater danger menaces the younger men and women of the present generation than the danger that some man, some smooth-tongued, learned, and polished professor, may make a prey of them by means of philosophy and vain deceit.
And so through this whole kind of study, this this rabbit trail, I, I'm repeatedly reminded that all of these deceptions that have been foisted upon humanity, whether they be cosmological or all these things involving science, medicine, and technology, and politics, and warfare, bloodshed, usury in the economy, one where it's all spiritual warfare in the end. Every weapon that the enemy employs against humanity is to not just deny the existence of the creator. I mean, this is one thing you hear a lot in, uh, you know, especially in flat earth discussions and like, why would they lie about the shape of the earth and go to such lengths? Well, to hide the creator. Yeah, well, and this is true, but by itself, it's not the full answer either because many people come to the conclusion that there is a creator or that there is a, a god of some kind, some sort of divine architect. <laughs> the Masons do. Uh, the Rosicrucians do, and the Hermetists, you know, all these people that have, for centuries, have been giving lip service, at the very least, to the idea of a creator, but fashioning the definition of that creator according to human wisdom and philosophy, and not according to what he has revealed about himself through his word. And so, yes, the deception about our world is about hiding God, but it's, it's about more than that. It's about hiding Christ hiding the entire truth that has been revealed about our fall from the garden in the beginning and our need for redemption. Everyone knows that the human condition, the human predicament, that there is something wrong in the world, that there's something off, that we're striving to, to solve all these ills, and everyone kind of intuitively knows that it's broken. And the Bible gives us an answer that a lot of people ultimately have a hard time accepting. The one and only solution is the cross of Calvary and what Christ did, giving himself as a sacrifice on our behalf and being raised on the third day. In some ways it's so, it's, it's ridiculously simple, like what human philosopher would ever come up with this solution? To just believe and put your faith in the Son of God who became a man. No human mind would conceive this. But this is the conspiracy. This is the conspiracy that the scripture just plainly talks about. So, <laughs> so matter of fact, this is what the enemy of our souls wants to prevent us from discovering, prevent us from trusting, prevent us from being set free by. This is the freedom that really matters in the end. And, uh, yeah, all the stuff about, like, liberty and our human rights, our God-given rights. And it, they're all, they're all kind of half-truths, in a way. They're all kind of perversions of legitimate aspects of the gospel, of the good news. That, yes, God has given us free will to choose. God is the one who gives us, quote-unquote, freedom of speech. He allows men to blaspheme his name every single day and to question everything he's made and everything he's said and everything he's done to question his character to question the messiah he has given us the freedom to pervert the truth of jesus for two thousand years and to just come up with all manner of mingling of the beautiful truth that sets us free with occult doctrines and gnostic lies and hermetic delusions and alchemical fantasies and cgi nonsense yeah, so much for the eagle cam. It is pretty crazy, like, how how can the world be so dark, you know, have elements of such darkness and, and true, pure evil, but also be so comical and absurd at the same time? I guess this is what the Bible talks about, like, foolishness, where it's so deadly serious, but also so, like, the folly of unrepentant man. So, bottom line, if... For those who, who were watching this and maybe still have not considered the truth of Christ, despite whatever other um, topics and deceptions and, and things you may have researched and looked into, like, if you have not found Christ, you are not free. And you cannot be free. And whatever we may face in our lifetime and in this generation and the years ahead, I don't know. In many ways, I find myself more kind of open in terms of eschatology, you know, I don't have a set dogmatic, you know, position on how it's all going to play out or how close we are or how literal is the mark of the beast and the anti, you know, all this. There's plenty of things to discuss and to debate vigorously and I, and, and we should be. And, um, 
you know, I never imagined that I'd be giving serious thought and consideration to the kinds of technological possibilities and, and wondering, like, is, is this what those prophecies in Daniel talking about the abomination that causes desolation are about? Or is this just more moon landing stuff? <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to know even what, what's, what's real and what's just lying signs and wonders. With each passing year, it, it gets harder to tell. And without the foundation stone of Christ, the cornerstone who became the capstone. Yeah, I don't. I I wouldn't want to be in that position of trying to make sense out of this world without the hope of His resurrection and uh, the peace that passes understanding that this world cannot give you. The riches of the kingdom that this world cannot deliver and you know as time goes on it just becomes more and more like even if you took all this stuff away all this craziness and the world stage <laughs> the theaters of war the rise and fall of empires our lives are like a vapor and uh, human philosophy and vain deceit and he will bring it all to an end in his time we can have confidence that he will never abandon his own, no matter what he may allow us to go through, that he will be with us, that he will give us the strength to endure and to thrive and to have joy in the midst of unthinkable evil even. Because it's already going, you know, sometimes I just stop and I go like, yeah, what, how, 17 million people murdered by just, by being conned? You know, not, not in some big, bloody, loud war or, you know, nuclear holocaust, but just, you know, lining up at parking lots and, and being pressured through propaganda campaigns and media. That boggles my mind that we could be living in, in the wake of that, that level of wickedness and that but life still goes on and people are just still going about their, all their daily stuff. Silent war. Vain deceit. Even all that is a means to an end, really, that is not physical. Putting Anthony Fauci in jail is not the definition of victory. And ultimately, God is the one who's going to mete out justice in a way that human courts never could. That's just impossible. And this so-called order of unknown philosophers, their nakedness and their folly will be exposed before men and angels at the judgment seat of God, so... The empire of this fallen world, the Antichrist kingdom, God has allowed this great deception upon the world. But he has already won, and the gates of hell will not triumph over his kingdom. And the only question is where your treasure ultimately lies. Where your, your hope and faith is rooted. If you've never opened up the word of God, I pray that today is the day that you do. If you've never opened your heart and used your freedom of speech to cry out to God and to, to talk to your Father, I pray that today is the day. And He will meet you wherever you are, in whatever part of the world that you're in, whatever circumstances you're dealing with, whatever addictions and trials and persecutions you may be facing, that you will find the freedom of Jesus Christ today because he loves you and he died for you and he wants you to become a new creation through faith in him and to be able to see the truth of his entire world and, and his plan of redemption unfolding around you it, it's incredible to see the wisdom and providence of God triumph over the folly and futility of man and the doctrines of demons because every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord all right, thank you for watching. Thank you for praying. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your patience. Um, I know I took a bit of a hiatus there. It was not planned, but I thank you all for all the years and being in this fight together. It's been an honor. And uh, may we press on together more boldly in our faith and more at peace in the hope that we have. All right, God bless.